Greetings. My name is Sean O'Donnell, and I'm the Associate Director of Academic Ventures and Engagement here at the Radcliffe Institute. On behalf of Radcliffe, I want to welcome you to today's program. Nevertheless, she persisted. A recital with the very talented students of the Harvard College Opera. This creative program is part of Radcliffe's gallery series, which engages students, faculty, and staff of Harvard University and local communities with the art of our exhibitions. Our current exhibition, which inspired this recital, is entitled Accompanied, the artworks of Marilyn Pappas and Jill Slosberg Ackerman. This exhibition, now online, features the work of two artists who first met at Radcliffe's Bunting Institute over four decades ago. Accompanied speaks to their abiding friendship, the intimacy and collective nature of artistic endeavor, and especially to the endurance, the challenges and possibilities that accompany every female artist who seeks to bring her work into the world. If ever there was a time for us not to feel isolated from one another and to find new ways of connecting to accompany one another during challenging times, it must be now. And how wonderful is it that we find ourselves turning to music and art in today's program to explore those truly human affinities which can inspire us to find strength in the communities that we create and offer all of us reasons to persist. Before I turn the program over to Nevi Ravi, who is Harvard College's uh, Opera's recital coordinator, I just want to provide you with a brief overview of the format for today's program. Today's program will open with some framing remarks by Nevi, uh, followed by student performances. After the recital, there'll be a conversation with some of the students involved in this project and we'll take audience questions. We encourage you to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time during the program. Since we anticipate a lot of questions, we ask that you keep them short so that we can answer as many as possible. It is now my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Nevi Ravi. Thank you, Sean. Hi, my name is Nevi Ravi. I'm a senior at the college and the recital coordinator for Harvard College Opera. Thank you so much for joining us today for this production of Nevertheless, She Persisted, a recital inspired by the Radcliffe exhibition accompanied the artworks of Marilyn Pappas and Jill Sosberg Ackerman. This recital features works from the accompanied exhibition, as well as performances by Harvard students. The musical works presented in this program consist of compositions by European and American female composers who resisted the cultural norms of their time, bringing these musical gifts to the world. However, many of the works in this program have been buried, silenced, and suppressed for decades. So we hope that this recital gives voice to these female composers who persisted. Without further ado, we are so thrilled to present Harvard College Opera's production of Nevertheless, She Persisted. Inspired by the connection to ascent and descent, and the horizon line in Blasfeld Riedfeld Slosberg Ackerman, an illustration, Imminent Collapse and Ascent. Our first selection is Soleil Couchant, Setting Suns, composed by Nadia Boulanger, poetry by Paul Verlaine, and performed by Benjamin Perry Wenzelberg, countertenor and piano, class of 2021. A weakened dawn scatters onto the fields. The melancholy of the setting suns. Thank you. 
A sonic embodiment of Nevertheless She Persisted. Elle est gravement gay by Lily Boulanger. Poetry by Francis James. Performed by Isabella Meyer, soprano, class of 2024, and Ian Chan, piano, class of 2023. She is solemnly gay. She was as soft as the yellow and blue velvet of a lane of pansies late at night. Inspired by the changing perspectives from the recto and verso of the works in Nevertheless She Persisted, the next selection is Sunset, composed by Florence Price, poetry by Odessa P. Elder, and performed by Alex Chen, baritone, class of 2022, and David von Behren, piano, assistant university organist and choir master. I'll seek this home in the golden west that lures me on in my joyful quest and find new life in that golden town that beckons me when the sun goes down. I know I'm 
Inspired by the unknown and secrecy that lies between the recto and verso of Nevertheless She Persisted, the next piece is Moonbridge by Florence Price, performed by Nevi Ravi, soprano, class of 2021, and David von Behren, piano, assistant university organist and choir master. The moon, like a big round ball of flame, rose out from the silver bay and built a bridge of golden beams where the fairies came to play. I saw them dancing in jeweled robes on the wavelet's rhythmic flow, and I longed to stand on the magic bridge in the moonlight's mystic glow. selection is inspired by Edward Snowden and the Return to Forest, Waldseligkeit, Woodland Rapture, composed by Alma Mahler, poetry by Richard Demel, and performed by Rebecca Ayrton, soprano, class of 2023, and April Chen, piano, class of 2023. The wood begins to stir, night draws near the trees. And beneath their branches, I am utterly alone, utterly my own. Thank you. 
next selection is inspired by the themes of dance and travel from Maps and Masks, Imperia Persarum et Macedonum. Tarotel, composed by Pauline Viardot, poetry by Antonia Leonard, and performed by Natalie Chu, soprano, class of 2022, and April Chen, piano, class of 2023. It is a lantern of a ball, and if the sea on Ischia its waves amass, its big voice will resonate. It is a signal for dance. Dance, dance, the tarotel. Inspired by Nike, the winged Greek goddess of victory, featured in fragments holding Nike. The next selection is Empress of Night, composed by Amy Beach, poetry by her husband Henry Beach, and performed by Nevi Ravi, soprano, class of 2021, and April Chen, piano, class of 2023. Out of the darkness, radiant with light, shineth her brightness, Empress of Night. Out of the darkness, radiant with light, shineth her brightness, Empress of Night. As granules of God from her lofty height, over cataract Peace. 
song is an ode to collected sawdust, an ongoing piece that resides in the studio of Jill Slosberg Ackerman and features the packaged shavings of many sculptures. I'll Not Forget, composed by Geraldine Saunders Herbison, poetry by Max Ellison, and performed by Amelia Lowe, soprano, Harvard School of Public Health, and Ian Chan, piano. Class of 2023. In a single file, my brain has set a list of things I'll not forget. In a single file, my brain has set a list of things I'll not forget. A sudden rain or moon or moon. piece for the afternoon is inspired by friendship. Accompanied, Two Views of the Sea features a frame created by Jill Slosberg Ackerman, which surrounds and supports the drawing by Marilyn Pappas. Do matin de printemps, of a spring morning, composed by Lily Boulanger and performed by Jessica Shand, flute, class of 2022, accompanied by Benjamin Perry Wenzelberg, Piano, Class of 2021.
I just want to say that was really wonderful. Um, what a pleasure to hear such thoughtful, vibrant, creative, multimedia performances like this. Um, the inclusion of piano, voice, flute, poetry with the art is just a really dynamic combination. Uh, we are getting a number of different questions and comments in the chat, and I want to encourage others who are out there if they may have questions to submit them in the Q&A. Uh, it really was, um, I think there's a lot to discuss here and a lot to, a lot to dive into. Uh, we do have some of our performers and Brian who uh, was doing the sound mixing for us on this uh, here and available to answer questions. Um, I can already see some questions. Um, and by the way, there are a lot of people coming in with um, <clears throat> uh, just saying what a great performance it was and how much they appreciate it. So I think one thing we miss in this world is the applause. And if we could hear it, that's what we would be hearing right now. And uh, as, a, as a thank you, as a response to what you've given us. So uh, again, thank you. Um, one, of the, one, of, one of the areas that I think is, is uh, that I see sort of coming together in different ways here in the questions is about how did you choose these songs? You know, how did you pair them uh, with the art? Uh, how did you even know how to, um, how to make sense of the art itself uh, and, and how that played out with what you were looking for. Um, Nevi, maybe you want to start with that because I know Nevi was the coordinator behind all of this and did this did a brilliant job in putting all this together. So I just, we should start with her first and maybe you want to popcorn around to others, um, some ideas and thoughts. Yeah, great, thank you so much. So I guess it all started with our first introduction to the exhibition, starting with the virtual opening in late September. And just hearing Jill and Marilyn speak about their art, their friendship and feminism that is thread throughout all of it. It, first of all, it was quite clear initially that the existing canon of art songs wouldn't best serve this exhibition as in many of the art songs that we learn um, in our lessons and perform and here in albums are often probably 99% of them composed by male composers. And if there's a female character, they are usually reduced to an object of desire or lusted after or searching for love always tied to a man. So I think it was quite clear initially that we wanted to program um, a program with solely female composers and really bring out their voices in this as well. And so it was quite difficult finding these songs since much of the canon is composed of these art songs composed by male composers. There's this wonderful database actually called the Cassia database for art songs by women composers. And there are these like comprehensive spreadsheets with lists of female composers that go back 400 years and all of their compositions and potentially links to the scores and etc. And around this time when we were thinking about songs to program, we met with the exhibition curator and had a private tour with um, Meg Rothsell, who 
was just so brilliant in so many ways, but really helped us understand the intention and significance behind each of the pieces in the exhibition. So then after this meeting, um, we were kind of reflecting and over the past three years or so, we've been you know, um, crafting these recitals in collaboration with the gallery, but in those you know, live events in the physical space, the music and art are juxtaposed together quite naturally as the singer and the pianist are in the center of the gallery and the artwork is around the space and there, and the music and art are in conversation quite naturally, I guess. And in the virtual realm, it's a lot more difficult to recreate that experience without bringing that art right into the center of whatever is being programmed and whatever is being offered musically. So after that tour with Meg, we really went back to the drawing board and started looking at the text of the songs first, just to see um, in the poetry, if there were any like salient connections with um, the significance behind the art that Meg mentioned, or even some of her words in describing some of the pieces. For example, um, Moonbridge, which is one of the pieces that I sang by, Fl by Florence Price, um, accompanied essentially this image of um, Pappas's artwork, um, nevertheless, she persisted and it was kind of like where the front of the dress and the back of the dress connected. And the way that Meg described it was that there's some sort of secrecy there because we know what lies on the outsides of both of these pieces of fabric, but not necessarily what lies in the center. And, and as a viewer, you're curious to see what is connecting these two kind of um, artistic offerings. And in that, I pulled from this song by Florence Price called Moonbridge, where she talks about there is like a beam that a beam of light that the moon portrays or gives to the earth. And on this beam, there's all these fairies and a, a queen and all and their life in this fantastical realm that exists in this bridge that connects um, the moon with the earth. And I think just seeing these images and Meg's description of the art was really helpful in um, curating this program for sure. Um, I guess I would love to turn it over to like Benji and Jessica to talk a little bit about um, why they chose their piece as well for the duet at the end with Food and Piano. Jess, do you want to start or should I? <laughs> Go for it. Sure. Um, well, Jess and I have collaborated in Harvard College Opera both as board members and as production members and as friends for several years now. And we have been wanting to do some kind of duet together in this sort of capacity. And we had the opportunity actually to be roommates for a month in Cambridge in September and did some fun collaborating while there playing some, some fun music. And we were thinking about this piece basically since then. And, uh, and this was just such a wonderful opportunity from our different distinct locations to, to still really feel like we were collaborating in such a spontaneous and, and meaningful way. Totally. And um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about this too, Benji, but I think it was an interesting choice um, because this kind of music that Lily Boulanger writes feels very, not free form, but very much um, suited for a live environment where you can kind of push and pull um, between the performers. And so we had to have a lot of um, discussion and thought that went into uh, planning before actually recording because of all of these choices that could be made in a live situation but wouldn't necessarily line up so well with a click track. Yeah and at the same time I think both of our instincts are, are often artistically really on the same page which is always really meaningful um, personally as well and, and this kind of music is something that you sort of just have to feel and, and in thinking about the accompaniment literally our accompanied exhibit that we uh, that we're working with here at Radcliffe it, it was certainly a very special experience sort of talking through this and then and then sort of doing it in in our distinct ways and, and seeing it now come together I mean it's it's really a testament I think to a technology and and be hopefully hopefully what we share in terms of musical instincts and um, I know both of us are, are big passionate admirers of Lily Boulanger's music uh, kind of at large so this is also quite a personal treat. 
That's wonderful. In fact, we've had a few comments saying how nice it is to hear Nadia Boulanger's uh, songs here so and music. So that's fantastic. Um, I just want to pick up on what you were talking about a little bit there about, about the, the, the collaboration uh, from different locations. Um, some people are asking about um, what this process was like of bringing this recital together, you know, of uh, doing it remotely. Um, I'm sure there were a number of challenges involved and uh, were there any benefits as well, I guess is, a, is one way to ask the question. And were, did anything really surprise you in this process? Um, I know we have Brian with us here too. I think he was um, really instrumental in, uh, in pulling the music together. So maybe we could start with him and then, and then, and then, and then move about. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sean. I think that the greatest challenge when you're trying to take an event that is traditionally an acoustic event that's live and put it in a digital realm is to not over engineer it and not make it feel like it's overproduced. Um, a lot of the, the choices that were made, I think were, were made to directly respect the original performance and, and, and to avoid over editing, let's say the, the singing or over editing the, uh, the piano parts, you know, for the accompaniment. And I think the key to making it all sound as well, like it was in the same space was to, to have a template where everything is in the same virtual acoustic and that really using that as a building point and then trying to make the, the performances recorded in disparate regions as they are work more with one unified virtual acoustic. And I think that is, is probably the way to do it in terms of arranging these these pieces in a program together where you have to have a something that was recorded in somebody's three by three you know bedroom sitting next to something that was recorded in somebody's you know nine by eight living room for example so i i'm curious as to how the process felt for the the people that were recording the these pieces and submitting them because i haven't personally done as much of that on the the performing side so i, I wanted to know especially was it uh, a, a daunting thing to do to record yourself rather than performing extemporaneously? Yeah, that's a really good question, Brian. I think just in terms of how the timeline of our process looked. So um, essentially we programmed the concert first. So put together a, the songs that would be covered in the recital and then assign them to different singers and pianists. So as the singers were learning their parts, the pianists were also learning their parts and recording their parts. So once we had their accompaniment track, each track went straight to a singer. So the singer would put in headphones or something and put a, a camera in front of them, usually an iPhone of some sort, and then sing along to the accompaniment recording. And I think this kind of flips the scheme of what we're used to, right? As singers, we kind of trust our collaborative pianists to follow us rather than us following them in any way, especially such rigid following, such as the accompaniment tracks that we were using. But thankfully, um, we work with just incredible student pianists and also um, asked for like specific tempos as well. So that kind of eased the processes um, in terms of putting those two elements together. Um, I don't know, Alex, do you have any um, thoughts on like recording art songs specifically and this kind of flipped process? Yeah, thank you, Nevi. Um, challenges, definitely challenges. I would say one of the like more obvious things for the singers who are getting used to uh, recording rather than performing live are you know the technical issues. So you know having to take multiple takes, for example, um, you know recording on without a mic, for example, and something that was new for me actually quite anecdotally was um, for some reason one of my lyrics would activate the Siri on the phone that I was recording, so I would have to stop the recording because Siri would just start, suddenly start talking in my ears. I'd be like, well, okay, well, that takes just gone. Um, so, you know, things that don't really happen when you're performing live. But, you know, those are relatively small things to overcome, I would say. One of the harder things I found was when you're performing live, when you're collaborating with a pianist or, you know, any accompaniment, um, and in front of an audience as well, it's very helpful for, for a performer, for me at least, to lose yourself within that moment and um, let that sort of guide your interpretation. And, 
you know, it's like the adrenaline of not having a safety, a safety net. Um, and definitely that's something that's lost in this process because, you know, there's this, you know, this eternal search for the perfect take. Um, and it's very difficult to keep yourself motivated, keep yourself within the artistic vision of what you want to achieve um, with your performance. So definitely challenges, but also, you know, it wasn't all doom and gloom. It was, uh, you know, it's new things to confront, things that I feel like um, in this new age are gonna have to be part of a repertoire of any like young artist. So, um, you know, very glad for the experience as such as well. Well, that's really insightful. I, I, I was wondering, um, there are a couple of questions here I'd like to try and combine and pick up on this theme about accompanying um, and accompanists. Uh, not everyone has that privilege of being, having that experience to have someone there another musician supporting them uh, and feeding them ideas and that, that kind of dynamics. I wonder if you could speak to that dynamics, maybe a little bit about the experience as an artist and as an accompanist, uh, and then maybe also um, in terms of the work itself. Um, uh, is there, um, uh, I also want to maybe tie that into this idea of um, this long-term friendship of Meryl and, and Jill, this, the, way they've, the way that they've sort of supported one another through their careers and ups and downs, and what have you. Um, I think that's really fascinating for me to see this younger generation of singers responding to this and, 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 and viewers you know, to the art, responding to uh, this, this, this older generation. And this generational aspect really seems to play a part in Marilyn and Jill's relationship uh, and also in um, and you having you perform. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about a couple of things, the, the notion of accompaniment, accompaniment, but also this generational aspect. Maybe we could start with you and Evie and then move from there, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think I know Sean in our early conversations about um, potentially doing a collaboration in this recital, we were both kind of struck that the title of the gallery was accompanied as a lot of the art songs, of course, are always kind of accompanied. As, it feels like a duet usually in art song because there are such like fluctuating tempos and it, it's set, it, even though we usually call a pianist an accompaniment, it's really like a collaboration. It's an equal partnership in, in a duet. So I think I, the image that like really has stuck with me is um, the image of the, the seas and the frame from Jill and the drawing from Marilyn and how they both support each other. And I think as, as artists or young artists, we're all kind of learning how valuable friendship is in an artistic community in terms of like even putting this production together. Of course, we have like Benji, Jess, Alex, and I have been working together for like three years now. And um, I think that is why we continue to make music and find so much joy making music as well. So I think this accompanied aspect and friendship is really at the heart of it. Yeah, I, I would echo that entirely, Nevi. And I, I think that art song is such a natural place to go when we think about accompaniment um, and the notion of being accompanied or accompanying at the same time. I sort of had two discrete experiences, one in which I was accompanying Jess and another in which I was accompanying myself. And I think that often the, the latter of those two experiences for me at least comes from my own music, playing and singing. And it's been really interesting in this sort of pandemic time to look at other repertoire with that same same angle and realize actually how how different one can be, you know, within multiple multiple like facets of of sort of artistry. I think, you know, I, I really did feel two sides of myself when I was performing the work, and I think that speaks also to the power of the work of, of Nadia Boulanger's beautiful music and and Paul Verlaine's poetry that you engage with with these musical forces and, and you feel something greater than yourself. And I think that that's an experience of accompaniment in, in a much more reciprocal sense than we often give it credit for. And art songs, especially in this, uh, in this opera company, I'm proud to, to be music director for several years now. And, and we work often in largely big operatic spaces and, and to do recitals like this is as a countertenor very meaningful because I think operatic roles for countertenors are often sort of pushed to two extremes of time. And, and this art song 
central kind of epoch is, is really is really special, but also for, for Harvard College Opera as an organization to kind of turn to these, these beautiful sources of music that are so often not presented in the way that, that opera on a grand scale is as a source of meaning and collaboration. And as Nevi said so beautifully, friendship. I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful to be on this, this call with, with everyone and to be part of this organization with all of you. And I think that thinking about all of those things through music making and art making and, and dialoguing with exquisite art that also celebrates those very same things, things that were made sort of over time, out of time, in time, together, but also in remote locations. I mean, I, I can't think of a more perfect alignment uh, of these two, two projects. Yeah, if I can just jump in for a second, I think um, it's probably true of a lot of performers, musicians, that one of their favorite ways to get to know people is through music. Um, and it requires a lot of trust to go play on stage with uh, with someone else and know that, you know, they won't stop in the middle of the piece or, you know, <laughs> you know, not a kind of do some of the things that you had agreed upon, that sort of thing. Um, I also wanted to say, though, that I think for me during the pandemic, especially living at home uh, without any other, you know, professional musicians, um, not being able to accompany myself, unfortunately, <laughs> like Benji. Um, Another thing that I've tried to open my mind to is the idea of other non-human collaborators. So I really think that like the space that you play in is equally a collaborator. Um, and so is the technology that you're working with. And so I've tried to reframe my mindset and um, like use the technology as a collaborator and as a whole nother palette of colors um, that I can turn to. And oftentimes these weird things that happen like perhaps what Alex was saying with like Siri being activated can turn into real opportunities for inspiration. Um, so I guess I just want to drive the point home that collaborators are especially special when they're friends and humans, but definitely being alone has, has made me open my mind to all the things they can be. Yeah. I just, I could, uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. I was just saying that it, jumping onto technological collaborators, something that I think is really different, again, about this type of performance being digital is the concept that in film, when we're watching a video, our eyes are being directed by the person who is setting up the video. And, and that was a big aspect that went into putting together this production was that, you know, to recreate sort of the experience of being in that gallery, the, the choice was made to go with very static still images and not zoom in to any details because that would essentially be putting uh, a secondary message on the, on the art. Um, and I think that keeping the, the, the viewer's eyes free to wander around the, the frame of the, the art, I think was the most important part. So in some cases, being a technological collaborator could be about the choices that you don't make or the things that you leave unchanged that I think, you know, adds so much paradoxically. Speaking to the point of, of sort of generational aspects as well, especially right now, I think a lot of us as young people really first and foremost are thinking about where we're going, where we've come from, and sort of what our present actually looks like. And I'm sure a lot of people on, on different levels understand that to an extent. And I think that seeing such meaningful and powerful works of visual art, of music, of writing, of language, of communication in all of these different ways, certainly at least to me feels quite salient and, and quite purposeful as we sort of look look at this this music that's, as Nevi said, has been so suppressed really um, in past centuries, past decades, uh, much more recently than, than we'd all like, I think. And now looking forward at sort of how we as performers, as creators, as thinkers, and as people can really, can really champion not only this repertoire, but also each other and our, our own friendships and, and collaborations going forward. So, I, I mean, I'm certainly very inspired by, by um, Nyerlin and Joe and sort of how these works came together, I, I said before, kind of over time and, and through many, many years of friendship that began in an artistic space. And I think that that we have a lot to learn from that. And, and as young people, it, it certainly is a beacon of, of hope as well for, for our artistic pursuits and also for our personal selves going forward. 
That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I just want to say that it's it's so inspiring to see and so in, intriguing to see the response that taking an art song and then sort of using that to view the art itself as a, as a vehicle, as a frame, uh, really does in a different way focus your attention than just say a visual zooming in. Like it, it, it provides an oral focus, if you will, to, to, um, to viewing that art differently. And I think that kind of exchange is really exciting. Um, I have one last question for you, but um, uh, which, is, uh, which is from uh, another one that's uh, from one of our audience members, which is you know, how, it's a larger, glo more global question, which is how do, you, um, how do you see your art and your work at this point in time, you know, making sense of or dealing with the political pressures of the day, the public health issues, um, is there a way in which artists have some kind of uh, ability to respond that's different? Um, and uh, I'll just leave it like that and, uh, and let each of you sort of take as, as you wish. Yeah, this is a really great question. And I think, um, I guess I'll just speak more generally. I think artists it, o over time have had a responsibility in shaping like social movements, right? So we see this in civil rights movement, we see this all over the world really. And I think today um, artists also serve a really important role in a, first of all, providing comfort in this, crazy time that we are experiencing and providing some sense of normalcy, but also providing a different perspective or perhaps a silenced perspective on um, maybe political issues, maybe um, history, maybe whatever is happening and speaks to us in the moment. And I think this responsibility is something that I think all artists carry and something that we've also been thinking about in programming this recital and in hearing from the artists as well. And yeah, I, I'd love to turn it over to um, someone else to speak a bit more about this too. Your sentiment of comfort I think resonates very deeply. I, I took a class with Peter Sachs, a wonderful poetry professor here, and he talked about that word constantly and the etymology of it as something that that sort of comfort like community or being together and fortitude or strength. And I think that that is sort of a, a governing credo of art making, especially in the current times feels really salient. Um, and I think that in providing comfort, there's often a false sense that that's sort of somehow shallow or if not shallow, at least not the fullest that, that we can do. And perhaps that's true. There's plenty that we can do um, in addition to and through art making. But I think that art making, is, as Nivi just said, has an immense power as well and, and really is able to bring to life and bring to light a lot of things that, that we all feel and we can kind of cathartically and um, actionably think through them and, and look towards, towards real meaningful progress. That's really beautiful. I, I just want to add uh, that Jill Slosberg Ackerman has uh, has uh, put a comment in, and she wants to say, "This is Jill. You are all brilliant. Thank you for engaging with the work, and I think we all want to thank you for engaging for the work today." Um, this does conclude our program, and I want to say thank you to our panelists for your thoughtful perspectives, and to all our performers for your moving work. And I also want to thank our audience for the terrific questions. I encourage you to view our virtual exhibition accompanied the artworks of Marilyn Pappas and Jill Salzberg Ackerman uh, at onview at radcliffe.org. Uh, the link has also been posted in the Zoom chat. For information on upcoming virtual programs and to see videos of past events, please visit our website, radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for sharing this with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and please take care.